Let's close our eyes. Our gracious Father in heaven, what a privilege it is for us again to be reminded of your greatness, to be reminded, reminded of the fact that you are the God of salvation, that you have truly uh, worked out a plan that is so powerful. We long for its full impact. We long to be part of those group, that group that will be a remnant, that will experience the fullness of your salvation. Holy Spirit, you have been given to guide us and your instruction is to guide us in truth. And so we do ask that you will help us to be attentive to your voice, that you will lead us in the word, which is your sword, and that we truly will have circumcised hearts. Thank you again for Jesus and for what he has done for us. And now we ask that you will take over our conversation, that you will put words in my mouth, gracious Father, that the words I speak will be your words. Words of encouragement, words of hope. For I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So welcome to our study, Noble Prince of Peace. That's the heading of this whole week's study. And you know, it makes me think again of our introduction, where we are reminded of the person who actually invented dynamite, Alfred Noble, in 1895. He established a prize, which we all know now, called the Nobel Peace Prize, which was to be awarded to people who actually contributed in some way towards peace on earth. And yet, sadly, that Nobel Peace Prize um, has involved the people who have actually been awarded it, having been involved in violent conflict in so many ways. But what I'd also like to draw your attention to is the wonderful introduction that um, the author does give us of this week's lesson study, and that is Dr. Robert I'm uh, sorry, the person or the story he refers to is Dr. Robert Oppen Oppenheimer, who um, obviously was the person that was involved in the supervision and creation of the atomic bomb. And when they asked him, you know, is there something that can actually be more powerful than the atomic bomb? You know, is there something that can actually counteract this powerful bomb that they had created, he answered certainly. And when they were, you know, pressing him for the answer, they asked him, but what is it? What is it? And he softly answered this word, peace. Now, dear friends, as we notice there, that right throughout this world of ours, from time in the Garden of Eden, when, oh, sorry, just after the Garden of Eden, we have Cain killing his brother Abel. And from that time, all this world has actually been involved in is war. What, an, what a terrible thing it is. And yet we are counseled that during the, the half century following the end of World War I, which was supposed to be the war to end all wars, and yet we know there was a World War II, there were only two minutes of peace for every year of war. Dear friends, did you hear that? You know, for the 50 years after World War I, which was supposed to be the war as we read there to have ended wars, out of the 50 years that followed the World War I, we only have two minutes of peace for every year of conflict that followed after that. Isn't that terrible? And so again, who will bring peace to this world? Who will be able to help us to experience um, eternal peace, everlasting peace? So when I look at mankind, I think it's, you know, we have shown through the history of our world, that we truly 
are not capable of um, peace. And yet this lesson study was quite encouraging because if left to ourselves, dear friends, we will wipe out ourselves. Man will become extinct because of our hatred and because of war. And I was trying to figure out why is it that we are so prone to war? And I'm wondering how many of you are watching today and involved in the study with me are in a war. And you might wonder what am I getting at? But I want you to think about the struggle that we have in ourselves where we are fighting against the flesh, where we have the spirit asking for dominance. And we know that the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, self-control. I want you to jump over to Galatians with me. And I want you to notice, sadly, what we actually inherited from our father, Adam, right there in the garden. And I want you to go with me to Galatians chapter 5. And I would like to introduce you to this conflict. And I want you to notice... That if we um, look at it, and Galatians chapter 5 actually introduces us in such an incredible way to this war that's going on. And how will there ever be peace? How will we ever find that peace in our own lives, which we honestly, I'm sure, as every one of you, hunger for? You know, that we are... Um, to actually be those propagators of peace. So I want you to look at this. In verse 13 of Galatians chapter 5, you, my brothers, were called to be free. Now that's amazing. In our lesson study, one of the aspects of the, one of the questions the author asks is, what has been the serious problem when it comes to us and God? And that is our use of free will. And sometimes we feel that Exercising free will is when we are not bound by laws in any way, but that we are free to do what we want to. No, that's not really what it means to be free. Free is when you have the freedom to choose who you want to rule over you. But the difference recognizes you will be ruled over by somebody. Either it's going to be your flesh or it's going to be your spirit, but you have the choice to determine. Now, spirit obviously represents God, and we have the choice of allowing the God of creation to be the ruler of our lives, or we can allow flesh, which is the fruits of you know, the devil, to be the Lord of our lives. And I want you to notice something. People who don't even claim that there is a God or that there is a devil still are ruled by two kinds of passions, good passions or bad passions. That's really what it comes down to. And we can deny the existence of God, but we can't de deny the fact that we are governed by our passions. And I want you to notice that true freedom, according to the book of Galatians, which we're going to find out as we look at the lesson study, true freedom is found in choosing a master. And you can either choose a good master or a bad master. And a good master is determined by the way in which he gets you to do something. You know, I've discovered that if you want to be a good master, your control or your influence to influence others towards good reveals how good you are as a master. And the sad thing is when you look at it, we see how successful the devil has been that we've allowed him to rule in our lives and he has got us to actually behave like him. I want you to notice this. It says that in verse 19, the acts of sinful nature are obvious. So when we allow our sinful passions to rule, when we don't take control of our passions, you will experience sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discourse, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Wow, dear friends, when I look at that, and I consider again how that our world is, 
I get concerned. When you look at the world, who have we allowed to rule us? No wonder there is no peace. Well, in Galatians chapter 5, as I said, we've noticed that there will always be the struggle. Now, I want to get into the lesson study. And what I'm going to do is I'd like you to turn with me to Sunday's section. Okay. And in Sunday's section, we are introduced to the heading. And the heading is End of Gloom for, for Galilee. Now, I love that. You know, it's, it's quite interesting that Galilee was, as we have discovered through the previous chapters, surrendered itself by the choices they made to be ruled by oppressors. I want you to hear that. And, you know, it's so interesting that even Assyria, which they went to in order to get help from became an oppressor and i want you just to consider this for a moment that when we turn to anybody else but god we are actually by default allowing the devil to rule us and if we for example let me explain this if you think of ahaz he turned to the king of assyria to assist him against the two kings of the north that were a threat to him, that they were going to be an oppression to him. And the sad thing about this all, dear friends, is that this threat was, um, he turned to the kings, to the king of Assyria to assist him. And the king of Assyria did come and get rid of the presses. But that very king that he re relied on in order to get peace became the oppressor. Now, God's word clearly teaches in Isaiah that the, the rod that was used, that was used to oppress or used even as an instrument to get God's people to reconsider their choices. When we allow ourselves to use outside influences to assist us in the trials that we are having, we are going to be in trouble. Different, I want you to listen to me today. When we turn to anything, the arm of the flesh in any way, no matter what it is, who it is, that is, although it seems to be a temporary solution to the oppression that you are experiencing, ultimately you will still be oppressed. The only person that will not oppress you but will actually assist you to experience peace is our Heavenly Father. Now we're going to see this. Let me explain something. In the condition of the people in Galilee, we find, and it's recorded there, which is really incredible, that they were a people who were experiencing distress, they were experiencing darkness, anguish, and, you know, um, as a result of this, they, they had no way to turn. It was like, like the, the word teaches us, they were in total darkness. And I want you to notice that these people are promised in Isaiah chapter 9 that they were about to experience light. But I want you to see something here. And that is that the people in Galilee were people who were um, involved in the occult. Who because of the Syrians who, who in the end ruled over them brought in their form of religion. And dear friends, any religion, and I mean this, any religion that isn't teaching you to go to Jesus Christ, to be the Savior of your life, and to introduce you to the God of Heaven, which is our Father, any religion beyond that one that teaches this, is, is of demonic influence. And I want you to understand something here that we need to somehow recognize, and this is the challenging part of the lesson study to me, unless you see that the religion that you are involved in has demonic influence, you are not going to ask for deliverance. Do you understand? Now, the interesting thing about Galilee 
is that these people were really involved in um, demonic bondage. I mean, when you think of Christ, his message to them wasn't that just of telling them the word of God and what was going on in heaven, but he would, in actual fact, be confronted by people who were demonically possessed. People who had surrendered in some way to the flesh. Whatever form. And dear friends, you know, I want you to notice, people don't surrender to the devil voluntarily in this sense that they say, well, come and occupy, we know that you're going to be bad or terrible influence. They are sometimes thinking that the influence that they are turning to is actually going to help them. So I want you to notice something, and this is really incredible to me, because the author in Sunday section makes a comment that the reason why Galilee was to experience this wonderful salvation and light was because of this. They were the first to be conquered by the devil, by Assyria. Do you understand? Listen to what I'm saying. So, dear friends, we have experienced that the devil has taken or has fought us. And we, because of our parents, find ourselves already under his rulership. This is incredibly encouraging to me. Because as it says, the first to be conquered would be the first to see deliverance. Dear friends, isn't that wonderful? And what is it that will call us to require for deliverance? is when we recognize that we are under a curse. Do you understand? When we recognize that the choices that we've made, not necessarily just the choices of Adam, but our own choices, have allowed us to experience the curse of those decisions. That when we realize that, and we repent, we will then be the first to experience, firsthand, the light that God so willingly wants to give us and the information is that he can deliver us from bondage he can deliver us from the grips of lucifer so what i'm interested in is that the only force that is powerful enough to break this bewitching influence that the devil has over us is our heavenly father and the plan that he has implemented and if we will just follow that plan, we will find power, wonderful power. And I want you to notice now, so let's get into this. Uh, we noticed here that it wasn't by accident, dear friends, that Jesus started his ministry there in Galilee. No, it was already predicted there in Isaiah chapter 9 that a light would come to Galilee. That those who were experiencing the occult rulership that they would be the first one to actually hear the good news of Christ, that he had to share, that he had come to deliver those in bondage. Isn't that wonderful? Dear friends, you know, if you are struggling with something in your life where you feel that you've been in bondage to something, isn't it wonderful to know that the good news is that Jesus has come to set you free? If you just make the choice, if you just go to Jesus and say to him, Dear Jesus, I want to be set free from the bondage of sin. That he is powerful enough to actually do that. We have so many examples in his life experience where people were demonically possessed. And yet when he told the demons to leave that possessed body, they, they would scream and they would you know, make noises, but they would get out because they had to listen. Isn't it wonderful to know that Jesus is still the, the Al Shaddai, the God Almighty? So let's get to that. I want you to jump with me. And we're going to look at the wonderful um, influences. So we, we are now going into Monday section. And I want you to notice a wonderful promise to us there. In Isaiah chapter 9, we are introduced to this Beautiful promise. Won't you please go with me to verse 6 of Isaiah chapter 9. It says there, for, for to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. Dear friends, I love the, the way we have this introduction. To us 
those of us who are crying for deliverance to us a son will be given i mean what i love about this is already there's this beautiful hint of the fact that he's not just going to be somebody ruling from outside but in actual fact he's going to be one of us you know and what i love about this is that christ came to show that even though we find ourselves in this world that is so taken up by demonic possession that Christ was willing to come to this world and to show us in reality the true outcome of this war. We are counseled in Revelation chapter 12 that there was war in heaven but we are counseled very clearly there that that they were not strong enough the devil and his angels were not strong enough and they were cast out of heaven and who cast them out of heaven michael and his angels and who is michael no other than the person jesus christ and what jesus came to reveal to us on earth is that he is still god almighty and that when he speaks, the devil has no recourse against that. And I want you to look at this. He takes on human flesh to show you that even in the state of human flesh, as, as broken down as what it is, as captivated by the devil as what it is, he came to reveal that if you make the choice, he can deliver you. He can set you free from bondage. And I want you to look at the, the names that are given to him. And what the author did, which was quite incredible, was that he, he tells us that part of the heathen deities or the gods that they served would have various names. And it was actually just trying to, try to reveal the power and authority of those. And if in some way this is to be an example to us as to why we have all these names for Christ, then it means that he's all powerful. I mean, he's... If there is a God, he is a God above the gods. And if he is a king, he's above the kings. And if he's Lord, he's above the lords. He is the Lord of lords. He's the king of kings. He is El Shaddai. And I want you to notice this. The government is on his shoulders. I mean, what I love about that, dear, dear friends, is this, that Jesus is not just a person but he is represents a government and this is a government of peace this is a government government of prosperity this is a government of um, love um, the government will be on his shoulders and what he's going to do is reveal to us what it's like to be governed by god and what it's like to be governed by god is that he he will deliver us and he will set us free and we're going to come to this in the lesson study but in actual fact the very things that reveal that there's a problem in the world like a lion that will be a predator that will be eating an innocent little uh, buck in the field out there in actual fact when god rules that lion that lion in actual fact will no longer be a predator but will actually eat grass I mean, how strong is his governance that even a predator that used to just by nature devour um, other things would in actual fact become like a lamb, would eat grass like the ox. Dear friends, that's the kind of governance. I mean, I think in my life how that sometimes my sinful nature, which is like the lion, just is carnivorous in the way in which it is, but allowed to be under God's governance will actually bring that lion of me to actually be timid and that of just eating grass. Isn't that incredible? You know, what I want you to see, what I saw in this lesson study, that we are given so much hope here that these sinful natures of ours can be defeated and that the Spirit of God can rule in us eternally. And I want you to notice, let's look at the names. Wonderful Counselor. I mean, just think of that. You know, we are told that when Jesus left that he was going to send us a Counselor. And that is namely the Holy Spirit. 
and that he would guide us and instruct us in truth. I mean in true knowledge. You know, dear friends, if you lack any wisdom in knowing how to behave or how to do something or whatever, that the Holy Spirit is that wonderful counselor. That in actual fact, he's going to not get you be, to be caught up in bondage, but by listening to him and by following his instruction, you're actually going to receive deliverance. I mean, isn't that wonderful counsel, <laughs> wonderful news? Mighty God, that we've already touched on the fact that he's El Shaddai, that there is no greater God than him, and that, that even the devils tremble at his voice. I mean, there was this question asked of Jesus after he calmed the storm. Who is this man that even the, the that even nature, that even creation obeys his voice? Dear friends, are we talking about things that are inanimate in a sense, that don't have any way of actually making a choice? That's what they do. I mean, if you think of the wave, the wave just rolls in all the time because that's what it was designed to do. And yet God says to the proud wave, so far, no further. It is God that still has this power over his creation. His creation does not rule him. He rules his creation, which is the, the things that the fact that he's mighty God. I mean, don't you like this information? I mean, just think of it, everlasting Father. I mean, what I love about this is that we are introduced to the love of the Father and that this love of the Father is everlasting. I can't help but think of one of the scriptures we had to go to where in 2 Peter we read about the fact that the devil is like a roaring lion and yet we also read there that, um, that God is not going to allow or come until every person has received the opportunity of choosing to be set free and that if they do appeal to him, he will set them free from bondage. You know, as the word, as 2 Peter says, that God takes no delight in the death of the wicked, that he longs for all to repent so that they can experience eternal life. And dear friends, I want you to listen to this. It's not to find yourself in bondage to a tyrant, but to find yourself in, in servitude to the king of the universe who is love. I mean, that's a kind of rulership we should be longing for. I mean, and then we are introduced to this, the Prince of Peace. We are going to look at that in more as we go on, but these wonderful titles given to our God should encourage us that we can win this war that's going on and that we can actually experience true peace. You know, when I think of Jesus, where he said the peace that he wants to give to us is not of this world. It's a peace that you can only experience when you surrender to him and allow him to be in control. That to me is what I see. Let's jump to Tuesday section, the rod of God's anger. Now that was quite interesting to me, you know, that it, you know, in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 4, we read about the fact, For as in the days of Midian defeat, you have, a shat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them. Now I want you to notice, remember that when Assyria went against the northern kingdoms, or the two kingdoms that were actually trying to um, get hold of Ahaz, although he used um, you know, Assyria to get rid of the two northern kingdoms, that became the rod that God used in actual fact to get God's, his own people to reconsider that the, the, this God of deliverance, which was Assyria, actually became the God of bondage, the God of oppression. And so I want you to notice there's a lot of things coming out here that, that this oppressor that initially was instrument in God's hand, remember Nebuchadnezzar was God's instrument, that this oppressor, that God would actually take away this, this, this Assyrian authority, he will destroy it and bring peace to his people again. Now we have to choose that, dear friends. You know what is so amazing? There are so many beautiful topologies that are coming out of here. First of all, you know, one of the thoughts that did come out was the fact that when we look at certain of these scriptures found 
or you know um, verses found in Isaiah 9, 10 and 11 and even 12. We are considering sometimes things that actually have value there but also point forward into the future. We are going to be coming to that more and more but I want you to understand something that here we have the Syrians who actually in the end of the Babylonians who who come who, you, who come and take over and actually just you know take a Judea captive but that very instrument used in order to get God's people to be humbled God actually removes that instrument that he used and he lifts up his people again so there's this constant introduction that if God's people would turn back to him and allow him to be the, 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 the government that rules, that they will truly experience peace from all the oppressors. So, you know, dear friends, just think about this. If there are things in your life that you've turned to for somehow to bring you peace, but they're not bringing you peace, but oppression, that if you will just turn to God, he will allow you to experience peace true deliverance true peace okay so let's do something else now i want you to go with me now and notice that that one of the things that we experience with you know the whole israelites and judeans was the fact that they once they allowed the devil to have a foothold he made it a stronghold i mean do you remember that incident when legion which wasn't just one demonic influence in a person, but that it was an overpowering between 1,000 and up to 10,000 demons or 5,000 demons that took occupation of a man. Can you imagine how many vices gripped him? You know, and I can't help but think of that story where we are told that when Christ comes into our life, he gets rid of a, the demon in us. And then that evil spirit goes away, but later on comes back. And if we have not allowed the spirit of God to rule us, he goes and fetches others worse than himself and he brings them to come and take occupation. Dear friends, you know, when you choose anything else but God, it is a downward spiral. I want you to notice that in the end, it's almost a hopeless situation. But even if you should be in that place, like the people of Galilee, where you are so totally occupied by the evil one, notice this, that Jesus is still the one that can free you from demonic influence, no matter how many demons there are. He can deliver you, dear, dear friends. So I want us to move on to Wednesday section, and there we introduced to root and branch, which again is so prophetic in the way in which it speaks there. And I just want to use an example, another example that the author didn't use, but I wanted to use it just to show you something where we talk about root and branch. And I want you to notice that the author does hint towards the fact that root, first of all, and branch are the same thing. I mean, let's think of it. Adam was the son of God. Okay, do you understand? So the root of mankind's existence was a son of God. And the interesting thing is that David is one of the branches, the house of Jesse. So root and branch come from the same thing. Um, do you understand? I want you just to figure this out. That when we talk about root and branch, we are actually talking about the same thing. Okay, so let me explain what I'm trying to say to you. I want you to go with me to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. Now I want you to notice something there. It says in Malachi chapter 4 that there will come a day when there's going to be a furnace. So let's just read it. Verse 1. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and evil doers will be stubble. And that day is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Al Shaddai again. Then it says these words, not a root or a branch would be left in them. Now, who's the root here? And who's the branch here? Dear friends, the root again is the devil and the branches are those who have followed him, have chosen to be his. So the devil and his angels and all those who align themselves with him have this assured 
a prophecy that they are going to be destroyed. In actual fact, we are counseled that they will be like ash under the feet of the righteous. Okay, so root and, stub, root and branch here, very interestingly, points us towards the fact again of some, some person. Root was God. Adam was the offshoot from that root. He was the son of God. And then we have going down out of his descendancy, we have King David. And out of the house of Jesse, the root would come and the branch. Again, pointing us again to the fact that God himself was going to come back to mankind and to deliver mankind. God was the one that got involved with mankind in the beginning. And the promise is given to us that he will again become involved in the affairs of mankind. So root and branch, an incredible um, story that comes out there. And um, I want you to notice, I highlighted this on um, Wednesday's section where it says, but the new ruler, listen to this, dear friends, did you hear that? It didn't say the new a nice person, the new ruler the new government, the new ruler will be greater than David in that he will restore peace even to the essence of creation itself. Predators will no longer be carnivorous and they will coexist in tranquility with their former prey. Wow, <laughs> listen to that. You know, this is where I just, I want to be under God's rulership. I mean, we're even lions obey. You know, I can't help but think of Daniel in the lion's den. You know, God made those animals there for a moment, not flesh eaters, because Daniel was in good hands. You know, God had control of them. And that's what we are promised in Isaiah, that the lion will lie down with the ox and eat grass. You know, it's just amazing, even the bear. So there's a lot of stuff that I've not touched on, but... I want you to recognize that, that there's another thought that comes out in Wednesday's section, which is very important, I think, is that the plan of salvation was initiated when Christ came to this world. It was implemented. It was um, put into practice. Christ became human flesh to save human flesh. But what is so incredible about this is that although that was like the root of the experience, the branch of it still has to be um, seen. And we are the branches. And the fruit of that experience of Christ, the fruit of Christ becoming human on earth and actually going out to make war against the devil and to, to break his influence and to set the captives free, there has to be a fruit of this war. There has to be somehow... A spoils of the war, and dear friends, the spoils of the war are you and I who have chosen Christ to rule over us. We are the spoils of that war, which means that he's going to come back. Once we fought this war and we are victorious, he's coming back and he's going to give us our crowns, our crowns of victory. And he's going to say, welcome to each one of us, to the kingdom, his kingdom, where he will rule forever and ever where we will be under his rulership and there will be peace forever and ever. I mean, there's so much we can talk about this. It was, I was just thinking, how do we fit this all in? And then the last section, which is Thursday section, which I do want to come to, it says there, you comfort me. You know, and what is introduced there is the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, which is Isaiah chapter 12, where we read this wonderful, um, um, almost song, that Isaiah puts together, a song of praise. And dear friends, I think, I'm not going to get involved in this, but you can only sing this song. Be part of those as we read there in Revelation chapter 15, where we will be singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. And that the song we will be singing is praising God, that He is not only the God who introduced a plan of salvation, but that He is salvation. That if you go to him, you will experience perfect deliverance from evil. So, dear friends, let's conclude. What I have gathered from all of this 
is that God was willing to take on himself human form so that he could show us that if we made the right choices like Christ, that if we chose his father to be our father, that we would have deliverance, that we would be able to choose to be righteous and that we will be successful in becoming righteous. And when I just think of that, when I just think of the incredible plan, it is something that we need to contemplate more and more of. And I love the idea that this week's lesson study got me again to contemplate the works of God and how mighty are His works, how great it is for His deliverance. And I'm wanting to be one of His spoils. I'm wanting to be one of those um, that, that those people that he will lift up and say, Father, look, the spoils of our warfare. We have these, the remnant. And I'm inviting you, dear friends, to choose Christ, to choose his dominance. And to us, a child was given, you know, and he is wonderful. He is almighty. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the Lord of Lords. I want to be under his rulership. What do you do? What do you want? May God bless you 